So Fukuoka is famous and infamous in a good way for uh, breaking the categories, definitions, and introducing their meaninglessness and the spectrum in between. Sometimes it upsets people. And um, I, I wanted to ask a couple questions about the blurry line between reality and fiction. And um, the first question is, who, who, who were the storytellers in your family? Or maybe they weren't, like, the, when you were a child, <coughs> when you were a child. In my family, the story, who were the storytellers in my family? Well, <clears throat> I had a nanny, <coughs> and um, the, so the, the, before we went to sleep, she would come to our room and tell us stories, like any parent would kind of read stories to their children. So other than that, no storytellers. So, like, there are no early inspirational figures for you? Uh... Not really, no. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it from a different direction. <laughs> like, I mean, I could sweeten up, up like, if you wanted no, romantic no, no, or... No, 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 just... Yeah, if you want to do it. So, um, the... Have you worked with children before this last film? I think my first, my first film, my graduation film, my first film, I had children actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like in one of the uh, discussions, you after the Kuzu plan, you mentioned that um, your brother used to put your mouse's hair on his face, and that oh, detail yeah. mm -hmm. came into your film. Yeah. So. Um, like those details of your life or your childhood, do they come into your stories? Well, I think inevitably, uh, when you're writing about a character, you, know, you, you use your observations and your research, uh, but also, you know, I mean, whatever is in your brain already from your own life, somehow, you know, will resurface and you'll make the choice, the decision of uh, either making use of it or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, if it makes sense or seems logical to me, yeah, I utilize all of that. I also take a lot of notes. Uh, you know, I'm a daydreamer. Uh, and uh, especially when I'm lazy and, and when I'm traveling, I get a lot of inspirations and ideas. Um, and I make notes, and then you know it's usual. It's the, the process of kind of <laughs> creating all that, and then collecting them, and then eliminating and getting rid of most of them. What what's the what's the method of taking notes? Do you carry a notebook? Yes. And right. that notebook is always with you. Or? Always in my bag. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, but I make even my shopping list is in it, so it's not like, you know, it's not a special book where great ideas are in it. <laughs> you know, none of that. So. so does it happen to you that like you find a great idea and then you say I'll write it just when of I arrive course, and, and I you can't even remember what But it is. somehow <coughs> those ideas will always resurface. I don't think I ever had a good idea which I forgot because good ideas always hunt you back you know and, uh, if, and if they are not good enough you forget uh, or if they are not important enough for you maybe they are good in, good ideas but you forget about them that means you are not with yourself so it's a it's a even it's a fair match uh, so um, the, um, and in terms of the digital uh, notes and all that, sometimes I, um, uh, I talk to WhatsApp and send myself notes, I take notes, <laughs> I send myself emails. Um, I don't know if you know, if you remember this, many of you probably don't remember, many, many years ago Apple had this device called Newton. 
which was like this big, and you could handwrite on it. It was it with a green screen, and it usually would not really recognize the handwriting. But, <laughs> but um, I, when that came to um, use, I used to have a new term, but then iPad somehow I didn't go into. You know, iPhone, I, I, I only use it for messaging, but not really. Actual writing, I'm still using a pen and paper. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's easier for me. And, um, the uh, little bit like changing the direction now, but um, I'm not changing it, it's still under the same thing. When I look at the contemporary Turkish cinema right now, I'm seeing the representation of women is still problematic. Like even our uh, one of the most famous directors, Nuri Bilge Ceylan, in his movies, the women characters are either fragile or uh, they are kind of weak. And but when we look at your movies, we are seeing these generous and powerful female figures. Uh, for example, the whore in Kuzu or the hot, hot dog standholder in Lola and the Holy Kid. I was wondering if there are such female <coughs> characters in your life that inspires you. Well, pretty much every woman character that I have in my life uh, are I, I don't operate in this <coughs> strong character, weak character. I'm, I'm just, I feel that I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. And pretty much every Turkish woman that I know, be it my cleaning lady or my business partner or um, my actresses or people that I know, my friends, they're just normal people. So. I think this question should not be addressed to me. This question should be addressed to the people who, who create weak female characters. And why they do that? Because I don't understand that. I don't think you. So I am not in any way doing anything that is. Um, I'm not creating anything unrealistic. You know, I'm creating. I, I don't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to have really strong female characters today. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't. I love your answer, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, Turkish, the problem is not really, okay, there are problems in Turkey, obviously. And then there are problems in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, in Europe, and the whole of the world. Uh, you know, these problems are more or less the same. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to really see these problems. But um, I think we all kind of, um, I don't think it's a really good idea. I mean, I don't completely agree with this whole 80s approach of um, intentionally creating something that is not there. You know, this positive, what is it called? I forget the original term in the 80s in this, not positive discrimination. Affirmative action. Affirmative action, that's right. I mean, yes, it was, it was very important during those times. Uh, but as with many of these things, you know, gestures and attitudes and positions, political stance that seem correct in certain <coughs> parts of your life mm -hmm. or certain durations of certain time segments of history, eventually even the most correct position will lose its meaning, will fulfill its historical mm, function, and if you keep sticking to it, in fact it, it may start working against the purpose, original purpose. For example, you know, in the early 80s when I lived in this country, you know, it was a very big thing to have, you know, this whole kind of <coughs> gay this, gay that, you know, the gay identity, gay, 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 you know. Uh, uh, of course, I was living in Los Angeles. And it was also very uh, important to have, you know, the act up and all that. It was completely different times. Uh, so when we made films with gay characters, for example, 
Um, during those times, it was very important for us to be able to have uh, LGBT uh, film festivals because it allowed us to, have, you know, to bring our uh, voices to, to public space. So that was very, very important. But eventually, this kind of evolved into this, you know, like when you made these films with gay subject matter, gay characters, and then you wanted to take them to the mainstream space for everyone to see. Um, like, I don't know, Cannes Film Festival, Berlin Film Festival, you, you know, just playing to the wider audiences, then <clears throat> They, you started, there was a phase when you started getting answers like, oh, this is a gay film, you should submit this to a gay film festival. <coughs> you know? So immediately this imprisoned you into, within a certain, what is perceived as a ghetto. You know? So what used to serve a, a good purpose, eventually as society and cultures evolve and develop, suddenly can start working also as a disadvantage, you know? And um, this is very, very uh, critical, and I think, you know, as you're um, practicing, one really has to be careful about these um, pigeonholes. Very important. Uh, there is, for example, um, a lot of Turkish women filmmakers who kind of played the card of being women filmmakers in Europe. You know, I'm a poor, poor woman filmmaker and I'm not supported in my country. You know, I need help. And of course, the European funding bodies think, oh, you know, horrible Turkish man beating up this poor Turkish filmmaker every day which couldn't be further away from reality. But, you know, this is what they're thinking, you know, the kind of whole liberal, Western liberal guilt. Eventually, these things turn into a form of trade. Um, and yes, it works to finance all these projects, but then it can also very easily um, degenerate into other things, you know, and uh, not really start serving against the original good purpose of empowering women filmmakers or gay filmmakers or minority filmmakers or whatever you want to call it. You know, um, I don't know, like again, early 80s, you know, it was really important to talk about ethnic cinema. You know, or ethnic positions, ethnic this, ethnic that. But, you know, how many times did you have a French director visiting um, <coughs> Turkey or American director visiting Turkey and being called an ethnic film director, <laughs> you see? So this immediately Yes, in, in initially it can open up certain uh, easy positions, easy things for that filmmaker, <coughs> you know. But in fact, what it does, it it it, it is creating a certain hierarchy, and that will stick with you all your life long. You can be sure of this. You know, when I met Lola and Billy the Kid which was perceived to be, you know, like, um, oh, you know, he makes a film about transvestites. Mm. So, and then I get like 20 screenplays all about transvestites, as if like I am the you know, expert on transvestites. You know? So this is going to stick with you, and this is something that, um, that can have empowering, important functions, but it is something that you really know how to use and manipulate as an artist. If you really choose the easy way, you are going to find yourself in a pigeonhole, and you will not be able to, able to leave it. 
This is very, very important. And it's a big challenge for artists and filmmakers, novelists or whatever, uh, <coughs> from non-Western uh, geographies. So that I think that for next, like the maybe next thing is, in order to raise money or produce these very expensive pieces, both film and the art, art installations are expensive forms, you have to um, navigate these relationships and have these relationships. And then that's one thing that you are doing. But on the other hand, there is this theme that keeps coming in your films and maybe in your life too, being true to yourself regardless of its consequences. So if you look at the Lola and the Billy the Kid, there is the like transvestite like choosing living that way because you feel that way and there are consequences with it versus there are uh, very macho characters there who are queer but who are in some sort of denial. So we are seeing the spectrum of that denying the truth, accepting the truth. And in, in the land, there's this entire town, they want to deny what happened. And the question is, like while, ne while you are navigating these money-related issues, how do you, how can you, like how do you achieve being true to yourself? Does it make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's a very natural thing for you, maybe you don't think about it. Well, I have to say, for, for one thing, I had the advantage of coming, you know, leaving my own geography when I was 18 years old and I lived most of my life outside of Turkey. So, uh, I lived in, in Los Angeles for a long time, I went to college there, so all my friends in the, you know, were, were Americans mostly. And uh, so I went back to Turkey, uh, and that gave me kind of a more um, wider understanding of the of culture and culture production and being active in the uh, art world. Um, so um, to me, I just have a natural allergy to the to this whole ethnic or kind of national something. You know, being defined on my national identity or, or any type of identity. I mean, I deal with identity politics myself, they, and that's important. They, but I don't, I am all, I naturally react to be defined. But they say Turkish film maker, does they know you? Well, I mean, I, you know, does it, does it, uh, if someone calls Tarantino, American filmmaker, I don't think he would be annoyed, annoyed. So, it, you know, but sometimes they call me things like, <coughs> I once, for example, in The Economist, they called me the Pedro Almodovar of the art scene. <laughs> Which, <laughs> so, so that was kind of irritating. So, uh, and it was a friend of mine who wrote it. And this is the problem because usually people who love you do these things most to you. <laughs> they think, I mean, this is a real scary thing because they think they are doing you a favor, which is even more insulting. <laughs> I mean, like, how many times a film critic calls Pedro Almodovar Kutlu Ataman of the film world? You know? <laughs> Not that I have a chip on the shoulder, but if you. If you get these things once every month, it's really insulting. Mm -hmm. and, but you know, there's nothing you can do about this. And you know, as liberals and mostly left wingers, you know, um, we think that the conservative right wing people are, uh, you know, and as it is very fashionable nowadays, the Muslims or the you know. They're all responsible for our, all our ills, but in fact, for me, no, it is the liberals and the left wingers who are responsible for this, that I had to suffer from this, you know, and this kind of racism is much more serious than, you know, I can't deal with Donald Trump. 
-hmm. you know, it's open, obvious, I can deal with it. But the other kind, I find it to be extremely insidious, hidden, and really a, a really big struggle. So, but I am lucky because I feel inoculated to that, because I came here very early, and, you know, I, I'm not, I never, I was never dying to be an artist or a filmmaker. I'm perfectly happy to stay at home and, you know, cook. And, you know, it's like, I, I, I've never been super ambitious. So it's not something that I'm completely afraid of losing or anything. So I learned to set the game according to my own rules. And I think that kind of also came naturally to me. Every person has a different way of dealing with these things, and I don't know how they do. <clears throat> But, I mean, looking back at my own career, you know, for example, you know, as it is the usual practice in Turkey, a lot of the artists are going to kind of sit there and wait for a foreign curator to visit so that they can visit there, they can show their works, and then they're invited to these Turkish art from the Bosphorus show in the Hamburger Bahnhof. Or, <laughs> East meets the West, uh, <laughs> you know, show in, in the Sophia, you know, this, what I call the, the caravan shows. <laughs> so, automatic no, and I don't even answer their emails. And this was the, this was even at the beginning of my career, it was like that, you know. I don't care if they call me an arrogant, difficult, person, complete asshole, or whatever. I don't care. I don't even argue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you accepted our invitation. I guess. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I didn't know what I was getting. Like, are, there, are there differences between the communities of, like, filmmaking communities and <coughs> um, of course, they are extremely different. Um, for one thing, what was really shocking to me is that how the histories of the two disciplines are evolved, have evolved completely ignorant from each other. So, <clears throat> for example, when I came into the art world, art world uh, for you know for the first time, I was referencing to you know, Stan Brackage, Maya Deren, you know, um, all those great um, pioneers of what is in this film world called experimental cinema. And uh, uh, even Ziga Verto, you know, big, big creators, they didn't know who they were, which was like, no. And then I would see all these artists making pieces in the gallery space, which were, by coincidence, you know, Zigaverto or Maya Deren or Breakage, you know, 30 years later, something that's been done, and the art world is talking about it like, oh my god, this artist is a big revolution, kind mm -hmm. of thing. But, and yet it was done 40, 50 years ago in Russia, or, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And vice versa. Uh, well, the film world nowadays is, wouldn't care less about the art world. I mean, they, <laughs> a lot of my um, film world friends think of the art world as kind of people who are completely self-satisfied and don't care about anything. They're just it's a close circle of people who are kind of talking about this nonsensical conversation uh, and, and that it is basically you know, satisfying themselves and completely um, not attached to life, you know. So, I mean, I, I kind of disagree with that because um, it's a kind of an anti-intellectual position, obviously, but uh, the, the, the film world is more down to earth, you know, more real. And, and it's, it's an industry, it's, well, I mean, the art world is also an industry nowadays, but um, but the film world is much more dependent on things like ticket sales, PR, etc., etc. 
art world is also becoming has become like that, but still um, there is some kind of pockets of hope, let's like say. Uh, but uh, all in all, um, you know, these are completely different um, practices and completely different realities of production, exhibition, and all that. But, um, and it can be, there's nothing wrong with that, but the fact that they don't share, they are not really aware of each other is, is, um, is, was mind-boggling to me. In fact, I was talking about this, you know, how shocked I was to a curator, I think 10, 15 years ago, and she said, hmm, hmm, hmm. And then she went to, she was a curator at the Whitney, and she put in a show about the relationship of the art world and the, and the film world. Not even a thank you to me. <laughs> uh, but it was a really great show. So I can keep asking questions, but maybe it's a good time to turn to the audience if you have questions. You described very well the uh, the way your or filmmakers from the east or from the south, global south are pushed into becoming ethnic identity filmmakers and so forth uh, in the west. But I wonder what's uh, what you say uh, what you have to say about the other side of it, namely in Turkey. How do they view your films, um, um, especially the ones, I guess, you've made only the Lola is the only film that you've made outside, right? Outside the country. Yeah, in cinema? Yes. Yeah, yeah in cinema, yeah. yeah. I wonder how they, how the dynamics of identity works there in Turkey. Do they try to push you into uh, an, 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 an authentic, Native filmmaker who's, or you know, whatever. What's, the, what goes on the, there? the process, the intellectual process in Turkey um, uh, is not this deep. Yeah. You know, it's uh, there is obviously um, discussion. Uh, it's kind of emerging, but most of the time, what you call film criticism is very mainstream, even in publications that um, pretend to be academic. Um, curiously, um, there is actually um, more intelligent now and philosophical, more real um, criticism, in fact, coming from the Muslim community. Uh, it is because they are that kind of going a renaissance of, their, of, of sorts in, in Turkey. So there are magazines and publications, not a lot, but um, starting to be in, in intellectual. But um, you may or may not agree, but they're consistent, you know, consistent criticism, so, and devoid of uh, ideology, just you know, you know, quoting uh, important fi figures from uh, film and uh, film history and philosophy. So, not so much uh, lately. Um, so, how was their reaction to your Lola? By, uh, Lola was, what, how many years ago? 15 years ago? So, I don't know if they, uh, I, that, that, the, um, there was no such thing in Turkey then. Uh, but, uh, you would be surprised. It's not like as black and white, you know. Um, there are, as many positions as there are people. So, uh, the uh, uh, I don't feel that kind of pressure. Pressure. I I am in film. It's funny in film. I don't really approach film as a kind of a very academic. <coughs> you know, from the from this kind of criticism uh, theory angle. Uh, I don't think I could survive the Turkish scene if I had, if I had done that. So I look at ticket sales and, and then and from that reality, you know, I look at, I, I have to think as a producer where the money comes from, you know, am I going to lose money or not, how many people would come and see this sort of film and then how do I manage 
not to sink so that I can make my next film. Uh, this is the approach that I had to have and um, I'm happy to say that I never lost money on <coughs> any of, even on my, uh, you know, kind of most risky films. Uh, this is how I do my planning, uh, my production planning, and I do my fundraising accordingly. And there's always a fair amount of risk taking. For example, if Kuzu, the land, the last film, had not received the, uh, the, the national best film award. award, then I would have lost money. But the award money was hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we made it even. Wow. I I may even made may have made like three thousand dollars or something. <laughs> <laughs> what was the budget on that film? Um but you said on the other night it was a very expensive film to shoot, right? Yeah, but very expensive film to shoot in Turkey, but it's like mm -hmm. uh, 1.1 million dollars. It's How many days? It's nothing for this kind. How of many weeks of shooting? Because you were yeah. five and a half. Mm -hmm. yeah. In one interview, I saw that uh, the Turkish film critics gave you an award, Siad Award. Yeah. And you were that was another ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I read that you were concerned that the film is going to be perceived as an art film and it's going to affect the budget. Yes, yeah. definitely, because. If Turkish film critics love a film, that's disaster. <laughs> <laughs> because that means kind of, you know, that they only love these, like, very kind of, um, how, how should I say, films that get reviewed well in Europe because most, most of them read foreign magazines and they translate them into <laughs> Turkish and then they pretend that they're writing. And, and if the films are about, um, you know, uh, I don't know, kind of with the pretense of social um, criticism, but really doesn't, it's not, it, it's not an important filmmaking, it's just that repeating certain politically correct things, you know, then they know it. <laughs> but the audiences get really bored and then, you know, 2,000 people go and see the film and then they go bankrupt and then they get angrier and angrier and then they make even more angry films and then, they, you know, whatever. But, um, so this is, um, this is the scene. but. And then, on the opposite side, there is the commercial filmmaking, uh, what we call commercial filmmaking, and they, they can fetch millions of people to cinemas. But these are kind of TV aesthetics and uh, kind of screwball comedies. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the scene in Turkey. Okay, other questions? Yes, Jessica. Hi. I was wondering if you talk a little bit about the relationship between your art practice and your filmmaking in terms of the process. Um, I know that's a huge question. I don't know what you would like to focus on, but I was thinking about the different use of the visual, the different use of the sound, and space in the two different formats. But how do you see those related? Anyway, what is that? Um, well, one is an art form. So, you know, it's a sculpture or it's a painting or whatever. So the relationship of the artwork, uh, whichever format you are imagining it. I mean, yes, I work mostly with video, but I do three-dimensional video installations. So sometimes I think of them as sculpture. Some, sometimes I think of them as something that you sit and view. And sometimes it's, it should play, but you shouldn't be a captive audience. You can just, as you are walking by, you can be exposed to it and then keep walking. Each one is different. Uh, I have, for example, I mean, my thing that I brought into the art world and people kind of reacted in the beginning 
and they kind of were up in arms saying, this is not our, you know, how come this is our blah, blah, blah. But it was a new, I was doing something completely new, and that was not, um, the art world was not readily accepting this in the beginning. And then as it is in the case, um, uh, with uh, reactions like this, uh, then the total opposite happens. Suddenly, you know, it's like, you know, they, they are all fighting for you. Uh, this is the art world, it's completely anti-intellectual, you know, uh, in that way. You know, it's all about branding, uh, who, who becomes fashionable, and blah, 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 blah. Um, that is the boring side of it, like in everything else. Um, but one of the new things that I was doing is that, for example, I would go to a neighborhood and I would interview everybody in that neighborhood and then, uh, and, and, and then uh, you know, show them in different monitors. So you would walk through their stories and each person would talk one to two hours. So this is like 60 hours of edited material. You know, and people would navigate in it according to their own, you know, haphazardly, and yet claim that they have seen this piece, and yet they would all walk out with separate, uh, completely separate experiences according to, based on whose stories they listened to and how they edited those stories in, in their minds. So this is basically the, in the basis of my uh, artwork that you you know on one hand it's all documentary it's all documentary material my raw footage are people who are talking and performing in, the, in front of the camera but I always show the process of constructing yourself in the public space in front of the viewer that's what I started doing it but that's what I uh, I was doing for the first time the moment they caught on this uh, line, then they were able, I'm talking about the art world, then they are able to elaborate on this. Uh, and then the, the conversation grows. And I never really thought of my artworks as objects that I created so that I would have more sales and all that. It was more for me to actually develop this, what I was doing. And then, at critical points, I would create an artwork uh, as if like, a researcher would publish a book. You know, this is where I am now, this is where I wrote it, and this is what the stage I'm in now, kind of thing. This was my relationship with the art world. It was very academic, uh, in a way. You know? uh, and I resisted to to galleries who told me to create objects, like for example, create stills of your work so that we can sell them and you know create uh, income, etc. I always resisted that, so I always ended up leaving galleries, <laughs> which uh, for a while it worked, but it also kind of created this thing that I'm a difficult person to work with. But for me, you know, my art practice is very, very important. And I lean more on the, my model is more the academic uh, practice than the so-called professional art world. You know, I don't, uh, so I'm trying to negotiate my place within that system always. Uh, in the film world, it's completely different. In the film, film world, I really, I have to create the films according to the existing rules. You cannot really ban them. Uh, I mean, you can ban them if you want, but then you are going to become a kind of an experimental filmmaker. But I already do that in the art world, so. My film practice, because of that, is much more conformist and conservative in the way, the way in which I finance the films. But obviously, I don't make Turkish comedies. I mean, but it's getting more and more difficult. So, um, 
at the moment I am working on a sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how I am going to create my income, hopefully, if it works. And then so that I can continue making independent cinema but, uh, and, and artworks. But so just it's to not clarify, working is, yet. <laughs> do, you, do you see your art and your filmmaking as separate tracks? Or? Complete, yeah. Complete, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kulu, some students, some people leave for class at one. They're not. You didn't offend me. Well, maybe you did, but that's not why they're leaving. So we we can go on till one fifteen. I know. I'm just saying that that's why some people leave. I mean, yes. We're not okay. Go. Sorry, I'm sorry. I have to go. But I made a mess of this thing here, so I have to clean up. <laughs> More questions. So, uh, yeah, just one last question. Yeah. It sounds like you've already broached what's next. And it sounds like what's next is what's on your telephone. No, or is yeah. is TV. I was wondering if you were gonna if you were gonna play with TV for a while. It sounds like you are. I'm not gonna play. I'm not. No, uh, in TV we cannot play. I mean, it's like, <laughs> especially in you, know, you just say uh, this is. Like I have, in order to generate income, you know, I, we were talking about different models, and you know, inevitably you know, the economic model, obviously, you know, because I mean people have this kind of um, romantic idea of the art world. Uh, like, you know, you do art, you, you are completely free. Etc. Etc. But sooner or later, if you don't have the, these commercial galleries or donors or big collectors, etc., there's only so much you can do, or you can do with certain mediums, but you, you cannot broadcast to wide audiences. Sooner or later, you'll have to face it. In my experience. But I don't understand, is sitcom for TV or not? Well, yeah, I mean, it could be interesting for the gallery space. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes. So if you're, if you're doing a sitcom specifically to sponsor your next film yeah. or art project, yeah. should we expect something very mainstream? Extremely. <laughs> okay, so like nice. something that would definitely sell. Married know. with children. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> Do modern family. <laughs> um, could you talk about some of the other filmmakers that you find interesting now, for wherever they may be, or that you point us to, or film that you enjoy watching? Uh, I don't know, you know, I watch so many films now. Really. So pick up You know, Netflix arrived to Turkey. Oh. <laughs> so it's like I'm in a, in a, show, show, a candy store only. <laughs> and, uh, but I, in general, I love Japanese cinema, old Japanese cinema. You know, Mizoguchi, Ozu. Um, I love Satyajit Ray. Mm. for different reasons. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, there isn't really like something specific that I have a very wide taste. I love, you know, ex like the other day I was sitting in the gallery uh, watching the film downstairs about um, the music about Charlotte. Um, what was her name? Charlotte Mormon. Charlotte Mormon. And uh, you know, I, I sit there for throughout the whole thing you know, because, uh, because it reminded me of the kind of things that I was doing in college in the early, in the mid 80s. You know? I even remembered the uh, video effects, you know, you used to have like these big buttons mm -hmm. and then it would give you this diamond shaped thing that waves, you know, she <laughs> I knew exactly what, you know. So, 
And I don't know, I don't really have, I don't always um, react to anything for aesthetic or high uh, art or high culture reasons. You know, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. So, represent so representation and equality, I feel like, are two hot topics right now in the American film industry. And I was wondering if you feel like this is a result of, you know, the more diverse artists getting pigeonholed as, you know, like a queer filmmaker, a black filmmaker, so and so. So then mainstream media is, I guess, left with just white men. You're asking the question to the wrong person because mm -hmm. I am a, I grew, you know, I'm 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And when I was um, your age, I was very idealistic and mm -hmm. I was like completely about all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in this country during Reagan years. And, um, and then I think I remember after all these Reagan years, I don't know why it was so important to get rid of Reagan, uh, but at the time it, it, it seemed extremely important. Um, I remember Clinton was elected and we were in West Hollywood and we were like, uh, you know, having a street party and I parked my car and because I wanted to park immediately and wanted to join my, my friends. And then, um, and then we had a big party all day, all night long in the streets. And then I came back to my car and saw this huge ticket, uh, which was, you know, I was still a student, so it was like half of my rent or something, like really, really big. I think that was the beginning of me realizing that life <laughs> is actually something different than you know, all these ideals and the things that we do. So, and more and more and more of these things, you, you kind of become a very cynical person inescapably. Now, during my, my times, these were very, very hot topics, and a lot of people took advantage of these issues. Um, now, would you consider that Spike Lee, Spike Lee's career went very, very far because I think he kind of, you know, didn't make, produce enough, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't call him a failure, uh, and I think he's very, very important. He was very, very important. But, you know, those, they were important during those times, his identity, you know, you know queer filmmaking and this and that. But look, nowadays you know, we have films like um, Danish Girl, which is an international blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Or you have, uh, you know, last night's Academy Awards, uh, you know, with all those politically incorrect jokes, trying to say they're good enough. I mean, it was very obvious. But, uh, so the world is, com is, a, is, is very, very, is a very different place now. Obviously, you know, you can be aware of who you are. You know, I'm a woman, I am African-American, I'm gay, whatever, I'm Turkish. Yeah, I mean, you can be aware of that, but uh, uh, personally, I don't think that this should be in pivotal to my practice, unless I really have something new to say about it. And I personally don't know what new I can say about being gay. It's such a boring thing at my age. <laughs> or, or, you know, or being Turkish or whatever, you know. I mean, it's kind of over. <laughs> Not offended, but each one of your films reminded me of other films uh, made by Turkish filmmakers. In the case of uh, Billy the Kid, for some odd reason, I was thinking of Fatih Ak Akin's work. And in your Kuzu reminds me of uh, actually his name escapes me. The one who made Yol, Yemaz Yune. Mm. And I was wondering if you think your work is in any way in conversation with their work or...? No, I'm not offended because 
I met Lola and Billy the Kid before Fatih was even started me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think you should really address your question to him. <laughs> but um, in fact, Fatih came. Fatih uh, wanted to be Billy. <laughs> so he, he came to casting section. Uh, and um, as for Yulmazaka, Yul, uh, as for Yulmaz Gine, we have a tradition of um, village cinema, Koy film, I guess this is how I would tra translate. And Yulmaz Gine um, was like the big gangster. Uh, they used to call him the ugly king of Turkish cinema, and he was like really, really kind of popular in Turkish <coughs> cinema. And so he did a lot of um, city films, in fact. His real kind of fame uh, actually is not films like Yol or anything. It was, um, it was the big industry. He was a big industry figure when Turkish cinema was making 300 films a year, which was, you know, I think the third, third largest film industry in the world. Uh, only in the um, mid-70s, uh, when filmmaking, uh, with, with the introduction of television, Turkish cinema industry collapsed uh, really big disaster. Nobody was going to see the films in cinemas. So the film industry was left with two choices. Either you made porno films or you made left-wing kind of, um, you know, the rights of the kind of not left wing. Um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm this, you know, extreme right wing, whatever. But um, how do you say it? left exploitation? <laughs> you know, like like black exploitation mm -hmm. films, like exploiting the kind of social injustice issues, uh, but at the same time being completely homophobic <laughs> and sexist or whatever. You know, so. These were the two kind of wings that the Turkish cinema kind of parts that Turkish cinema had to take in order to, to survive. And, uh, and Yilmaz Güney was the figure of, of that. Uh, with Kuzu, uh, I don't see any similarity with Yilmaz Güney's cinema other than the fact that I set my story in rural Turkey, frankly. My story is based on um, the Old Testament and Medea, uh, kind of, you know, contemporary reworkings of it. And uh, with all due respect, maybe he, he, I knew him, by the way, and uh, uh, because my house was used as a uh, location for a lot of Turkish films, and so he used to come to our house and make films. Um, I don't know if he had ever heard of Medea. I mean, he was that kind of guy. But maybe the Abraham and Isaac story, he might have heard. 